So my name is Villain Art, as uh, Lisa mentioned. And before we get started uh, with introductions, I just wanted to do a very quick uh, acknowledgement of the land in which I'm joining from today. Um, and so I am joining from the unceded, unsurrendered uh, territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. Um, I think it's really important uh, when you know we're coming together in events like this and spaces like this, um, even when they're virtual, uh, to be really grounding ourselves in an understanding and in an appreciation uh, of the lands and, and the privilege of, in which we carry to be able to join from these lands and to be able to work and have these conversations uh, around liberation and feminism uh, with a deep you know, understanding and respect uh, for some of the, the, the leadership of Indigenous women and indigenous, and indigenous feminism in those conversations. I would also encourage you, this is a virtual event and so you might be joining from anywhere, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat and also share a, a bit about where you're coming from, uh, whose territories you're on and what that means to you and how that connects uh, to the theme that we'll be talking about today. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Nora Loretto. Uh, she is a writer and activist uh, from Quebec City. She writes regularly for the National Observer, the Washington Post and many other publications. She's the editor of the Canadian Association of Labour Media and with Sandy Huston, uh, she hosts a popular podcast called Sandy and Nora Talk Politics. It's one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. She is also the author of From Demonized to Organized, Building the New Union Movements. And so tonight, of course, she's here to launch her newest book, Take Back the Fight, Organizing Feminism from the Digital Age. And in Take Back the Fight, uh, Nora examines the state of modern feminism in Canada and argues that feminism must organize take back feminism from politicians, business leaders, and journalists who distort and obscure its power. Furthermore, Nora urges today's activists to overcome the challenges that sank the movement decades ago to stop centering whiteness uh, as the quintessential women's experience and to find ways to rebuild the communities that have been obliterated by neoliberal economic politics. So Take Back the Fight has already received many accolades since its release including being described as an excellent analysis of the rise and decline of second wave feminism in Canada by Judy Rebeck, former president of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women, and a clarion call for large-scale intersectional radical feminist movements in Canada by Harsha Walia, author of Undoing Border Imperialism. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Nora. Over to you. Hi, Dylan. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, this is, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's bittersweet. We're not all together. And, um, and it's funny when we're virtual, uh, I, I, I immediately go back to thinking of organizing with Dylan when she was in Winnipeg and I was in Toronto and now she's in Ottawa and now I'm in Quebec City. Um, that is where I'm coming from is the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat uh, people. And um, yeah, and we are what at month 12 of the pandemic. We are at Zoom event number one for Octopus Books, but all of us probably are at number, I don't know, uh, 700. And so it's kind of a weird thing for us to try and talk about organizing in real life, organizing in a way that can't be manipulated, that can't be, um, that can't be uh, co-opted or that can't be bothered by power when we're talking through a for-profit you know, a digital platform. It's very weird. <laughs> so uh, I really do wish uh, that, of course, we were, we were all together in uh, the same room. But of course, I know that there's people joining us from all across Canada, and I didn't have to move anywhere. I'm sitting in my place and villains in her place, and you're all in wherever you are. And so that's, you know, that's, that's the, the silver lining, I think, of, of the reality that we're in today. You know, the, the pandemic has, has just blown open the space of what is possible, I think, for the left to see. There's so much bad, and, and we'll obviously talk, I'm sure, about the bad, but there's been two really great things that the pandemic has given us. The first is this incredible medical advancement uh, with the RNA um, technologies with vaccines. And this is not a talk about that, so I won't get into it, but I'm very excited and I hope you are also very excited about that. But the second, which is very important, is that the pandemic showed us that in the span of a week or a couple of weeks, the federal government has the money, the capacity, and the, the structures to create a massive social program overnight and transfer a huge amount of money from the federal government into the pockets of Canadians who needed it. And so the, those of us who grew up in an age 
and you know, I'm 36. So those of us who are my age and younger and a little bit older, who've never seen uh, uh, the, the creation of a social program like this, who only have heard about these stories. This pandemic has shown us that everything that politicians have used as an excuse against universal childcare, against a home care strategy, against public uh, residential care facilities is a total lie. And I think that that is so important when we're talking about rebuilding feminism, that we understand that the way that, that the government has framed feminism is to make sure that our, our, our understanding of what's possible is completely narrow, absolutely narrow. That a victory is a million dollars here, $10 million here, a task force there, a, a commitment, right? Those are victories. And in the book, I challenge us, I challenge everybody to think really hard about whether or not that is a victory. If that, if, if we have to be very honest with ourselves about what we're counting as victories, and <clears throat> critically, how do we build power to confront power? And, and I, that's, I think, something I'm really excited to, to, to be talking about. I know, you know, Bill in comes to the student movement. She's in the labor movement. You're, 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 you're in like the center of a lot of these locations that have at their core a democratic structure that, so that gives people power to be able to con confront bosses and governments. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that don't have access to a spot like that. You might not be unionized. You might not be in a workplace that uh, that your union is active. You know, you might be you might be you know working at home all the time and not seeing anybody. Uh, and I talk about in the book, like what happens when you're when you're 19 and you're like, what's feminism? Oh, I heard that there's a women's center. Oh, I'll just find myself on their couch. Oh, now I'm friends with everybody. Oh, now I'm radical, right? That's kind of how it happens for a lot of people. And um, when you're an adult, more of an adult than, than university students or college students, the older adult, you can't just stumble into your local women's shelter, right? That, those are spaces that are really important to have space for not to people to learn, but to access services, right? And so where do we learn about feminism? How do we learn about fe feminism if you don't come from a location where that kind of thing is there for you to stumble, to stumble upon? Uh, and, and it's even harder if you, uh, you know, have a bunch of kids and you're taking care of some, maybe some elderly relatives, uh, you're working two jobs or three jobs, and then it gets harder you know, as the responsibilities pile up. So what does it mean to, to take back uh, a fight? You know, and I was very conscious, like, as, as, as someone who's white talking about taking back a feminist movement and it, that it sh shouldn't be white centric I'm very aware of the contradictions in there I'm sure that we'll have some interesting discussions about that but when we're talking about taking back the the, the feminist struggle in the digital era I want us to really think critically what did me Too give us and what was the limits of me too and 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 were we ever were we ever going to be able to 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 advance action on gender-based violence and on denouncing uh, and speaking about our experiences with gender-based violence, were we ever gonna be able to advance that online alone? Uh, we have a, a prime minister whose first act was to say, ladies, I'm a feminist, right? Mic drop. And you're like, wait, you haven't done anything like at all. You appointed an equal number of women to cabinet positions, but who did that a year later with no fanfare? Francois Legault, who is, not a feminist icon. I'm not sure the guy would even say he's a feminist. And so we have to also take back feminism from these uh, political actors who have so effectively sanitized movements, have so effectively transformed what we understand feminism into being a common sense thing that everybody's gonna be able to say that they're a feminist with maybe the exception of like Derek Sloan, right? Like very few people except on the fringe of the conservative party would not be able to say they're feminist. And then we have to take back feminism, of course, from the corporate world where uh, uh, feminism is understood as being uh, related to your economic power. Uh, you just have to smash that glass ceiling and no one's gonna talk about how then all this like glass shards are falling on everyone below and be like, no, stop smashing the glass ceiling. That actually sucks, right? How do we undo the paradigms of, of what women's advancement is, um, has been kind of understood to be in the, in the, in the era of the 1990s, the 2000s, the 2010s. And, um, and, you know, I did a talk today to a, a class and I was like, wow, like, you know, yeah, we are, we're 20 years out from the, the battle in Quebec City. We're, we're 30 years out from the Martin Chrétien budget. 
And so many of these moments, which I, and I talk about these in the book, so many of these moments have informed where we are today. And so uh, take back feminism from politics, take it back from the corporate world, take it back um, from journalists who also decide who they want to identify as being the feminist spokesperson, whether or not there's any accountability behind that person. But, and this is, I think, where I'll end kind of the introductory comments, because I know that Dylan's got a lot to say, and I really actually want this to be a more uh, dynamic, even more dynamic conversation than I can make it. Um, but I think what's really interesting is, you know, we live in an era where um, neoliberalism has completely transformed our understanding of what social change looks like. And the book is about feminism, but <laughs> the secret is that you actually can swap the word feminism out and put in pretty much any social movement you want. And then the book still makes sense, maybe with the exception of chapter one, because <laughs> it's about the history. But you know, the the whole, the, the what I wanted to do with this book was to tell people who might know, but primarily who never have thought about this, that there are, there are um, steps that you have to take to, to form, foment struggle. That struggle is not Nora Loretto standing up being like, join my movement. Struggle is actually the relationships that we build when we're doing really difficult on the ground campaigns work. Struggle is formed when you've occupied a building and it's really intense and you're all spending all this time together and you like get to share your you know childhood fears or something like this. Struggle is when you're creating spaces where uh, you're eating together or your children are playing together or someone else's children are playing together and you're watching and you're like, I do not have those, thank God, but they're cute from afar, right? Building these kinds of spaces are really, really important. And we have gone through an era that has absolutely erased the story of the struggle behind the biggest feminist advancements within society. And so, you know, not to say that everything in the 1970s and the 1980s were glorious and that feminists all got together and everything was worked very well, but, you know, understanding that abortion was not given to, 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 to us. It was not uh, given out of the goodness of the hearts of any politician. It was a fight. And the fight to undo these things, the fight to undo maternity leave, the fight to undo um, you know, uh, pay equity or to resist pay equity still, those fights are getting more and more powerful. The far right is getting more and more powerful. And the feminist movement needs to, to find itself as the confrontation to misogyny in the far right, to call the confrontation to bosses that are trying to undo maternity leave. And, um, and to understand how that happens, you really need to have that, that, that history, but also the the, the elements of what does a social movement give us. And so social, give, a social movement gives us a place to generate knowledge that is outside of an institution where we can learn together, we can share the knowledge that we have and we can get knowledge from someone else. That knowledge exchange is really important because we don't spend the majority of our time in school, we spend the vast majority of time outside of school. And so how do we continue to advance our knowledge to be able to come up with better analyses, better talking points, better plans and all this stuff. Knowledge is critical. Then you also have to have debate and debate is really important. Debate is a way that you refine your tactics. It's a way that you refine your arguments. It's a way that you get strong enough to withstand someone yelling in your face and you can actually be like, yeah, this doesn't affect me. Yell all you want. I'm right and I'm gonna beat you in this debate. Learning how to debate within uh, ourselves with like, you know, within progressive feminist spaces is really important. And the internet has taken that away from us because the internet does not allow for debate. The internet does not allow for us to look at someone's body language and say, oh, maybe they're saying that, but they actually mean the opposite, right? We're just working on text and that text can be manipulated. It can be misinterpreted. It can be uh, difficult to even express because it requires a high level of, of, of literacy, which not everybody has. Um, you know, movements also give opportunities for leadership, which the far right is so good at creating. You know, the, the anti-abortion movement identifies leaders from the age of like 10, right? And then they put them on these like freaky speaking tours going from church to church to church till by the time they're 20 years old, they actually have practiced speaking in church basements for a long time. Uh, we don't have that on the left. There's, it's very hard to learn leadership unless you, you know, fight your way up to the top of an organization or you might win an election or, or, or whatever, our understanding of leadership is very narrow. And so creating spaces where we can practice leadership and we can actually 
generate leaders to then go into city council politics or into federal politics or whatever. That's a really, really critical role of the feminist movement that we've lost. And it gives us a place for accountability so that there aren't people self-declaring themselves as being a leader, but actually if they say, I'm a leader, you know that there's like a hundred people behind them saying, that person's not the leader. We actually, this is, this is the leader. And allowing the people that then bring the message of feminist organizing or feminist movements to the fore actually do have behind them the opinions and the ideas and the, and the debates and the decisions of, um, of, of, of many, many, many other people, that it isn't just about that individual. So that's the, that's the overview. I guess the most important part of the book is the, is the last couple of chapters where I talk about how feminism has to be anti-capitalist, it has to be anti-racist, and it has to be anti-colonial. And, and you know, in Canada, it is so important that we start there because all of the oppression within our society flows through uh, a, a colonial construct that was either set up to govern Canada, define Canada, allow people to just steal resources in some sort of like wild get rich quick screen scheme. And through colonialism, patriarchy, white supremacy and racism have all been constructed. And if we don't understand that, if we look at the statistics that came out recently and saw and see that 160 women were killed uh, in, in uh, gender based violence situations in last year, and we don't understand instantly the impact that it had on indigenous women first, then we are erasing and limiting the capacity that we collectively have to understand what the real source of the problems are. Is the real source of the problem a piece of legislation or is the real source of the problem that Canada to its core is a colonial nation that has sought from the founding of the nation to subjugate women, to violate women, uh, to control women. And of course, I also should say, when I say women, I, I'm totally cis and trans inclu inclusive. Um, that, that this is the origin of Canada. And if we don't understand that, then we, we miss all of the connections between clean drinking water, pipelines, between uh, man camps, right, within labor camps, uh, between uh, urbanization, uh, b between transportation, between housing, like there's so many connections and we need to make those connections if we're gonna be as powerful as we have to be. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, there's like there's so much in everything that you've just said that is so exciting and that we could definitely spend the rest of the hour that we have together chatting about and I want to get to many of those points but I guess I want to sort of rewind a little bit and talk about maybe some of the the inspiration behind this book and where you know the, the title take back the fight I know for so many people myself included obviously you think about take back the night you think about you know being out on the streets uh with hundreds if not thousands of feminists depending on where you were at the moment um and you know taking those chants out talking about uh, you know what it means to actually instill an understanding and a level of safety in our communities that we know is missing because of misogyny, because of that violence, because of all those systems that you just talked about. So I was wondering if you could, you know, you talk about this a little bit at the beginning of your book, but if you could take yourself back to those first marches, to that first Take Back the Night event that you participated in. And could you tell us a little bit more about how that impacted you? Because, you know, you allude to the fact that, the, you know, it was those spaces and also, you know, spaces within the student movement where, you know, you didn't necessarily have a formal education in women's issues or feminist politics, but that's where you were able to help sort of formulate or shape those first ideas. So can you go back to that and tell us a little bit more about how those spaces really impacted how you thought about feminism and how that leads into, you know, where this book is coming Yeah, that's such a, it's, it's great. And it's like, cause you, you studied uh, gen, um, women's studies, right? Women, women gender studies. Is that your background? No, no you didn't. Clearly, I didn't. I am now in my uh, in my master's program. But similarly to you, I had no idea what feminism meant until I walked into the women's center at the University of Manitoba. So, yeah. right, okay, yeah. So it's it's funny because you know, like growing up in the 1990s, like feminism wasn't like a bad word, and it wasn't something that I thought about very much. Like I I I had I, my parents are like progressive, like they were involved with their union, but they weren't like activists or anything like that. Um, and my grandmothers both worked. I mean, you know, like I, I came from a family of working people. So I didn't like, you know, it didn't really even occur to me that there would be any difference. Like all I knew about like women's work was that like my mom had less seniority than my dad because she had to take a maternity leave. That's all I knew. They're both teachers. 
Um, and so when I got to university, I was, um, I was like 100% oriented towards getting rid of Mike Harris. And so I was like on the election kind of like track. And, um, and so the women's center for me was like, like, <laughs> hey, ladies, like you guys do that, like lady stuff. And it, it took like friendships with people being like, Nora, like get over yourself. I'm like, okay, fine. Uh, and also getting involved in politics where, you know, <laughs> sexism is like completely inescapable. And so I found myself at a, at a take back the fight, uh, take back the night rally, uh, you know, in September in Toronto. Um, uh, it was, it was either first or second year. I mean, it was like really early within my, uh, my life at Ryerson. And, um, and it was like this moment where I was, I was kind of like finally realizing that, you know, when, um, when you create these spaces for people to come together, uh, to then like show into the void and, and send this message out that we are not afraid and you cannot attack us and we are together and we are taking back the night. It was really, really powerful. Now I didn't know the story behind Take Back the Night um, until quite a bit later. And, and so, you know, this idea that, um, you know, Barbara Schleifer was, uh, 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 she, she was celebrating being called to the bar and the night she celebrated being called to the bar, she was, uh, you know, violently murdered. And, um, and it, it happened at a moment in, in the feminist movement where things were organized enough to then spark action. You know, there's, there is a bit of debate, was the first take back the night in Toronto with that action, or was it in Vancouver, which would have happened just before. Um, but, but the first one that was built take back the night was, was in Toronto after that, that violent um, uh, event. And I, and I talk about it in the forward in the book. And so, yeah, I really, I, I, you know, coming up with the title was funny because we, like titles are really, really hard. And I, what I actually really wanted to call the book and the editor was like, are you, no, uh, it was nothing to lose, but their gains right? Like nothing to lose, but our chains, right? Uh, and the line appears in the book somewhere uh, and she still didn't like it, my editor. And I'm like, yeah, but, but she's like obviously wonderful and amazing. But, but Take Back the Fight seemed like this wonderful call back to the rich history of, of organizing creative actions and, and protest and radical, radical feminism and um, talking about how it has been so co-opted that we really do need to take hold of Take, like really try to wrestle it away from the Mary Monsefs of the world, the Justin Trudeaus of the world, the, um, the Globe and Males of the world uh, to, 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 you know, remind people that it's like, no, no, that is not actually feminism. That is a kind of politics that's like feminist impact on mainstream politics. But what feminism needs to do is confront power and confront patriarchy. And those institutions are literally the things that perpetuate sexism, patriarchy, white supremacy, colonialism. So... Yeah. yeah. Thank you for some of that. <laughs> um, I think it's really interesting. I think that we had sort of very similar um, apprehensions at first about being a basis. And like, I definitely thought that it was like all bra, bra burning, like every single, um, I think, uh, stereotype that you might think of a of, of feminist. And it honestly, it's it's been a space where I formed some of the deepest friendships and relationships that I have today. So um, it, it, it is really cool to, to to uh to talk about like what it means to come into these spaces not from a not sort of maybe so traditional background or a not sort of an entrenched background um i was hoping uh next to talk a little bit more about some of the central arguments uh in your book specifically around dissecting neoliberalism and digital age feminism it's a huge part of it and i i guess i was trying to kind of put myself um in the shoes of folks that maybe might be a little bit um apprehensive or unsure about this message specifically around you know some of the uh disadvantages of a uh, disaggregated or a decentralized movement and so i think that you know many of us have probably heard these arguments before especially uh, you know when we're talking about uh these are natural progression of politics that we just need to get with the times that this is you know that the iterations of what we're dealing with right now in terms of movement building are inevitable because you know because of what what has happened uh, with digitization and social media and so on and so forth so what what are some of the things that you might say back to people that it, you maybe disagree with some of those central arguments and, and might actually say that you know in fact uh being able to have these decentralized movements and you know what you might describe as disorganized movements in, in, in those spaces that are, there is perhaps more opportunity for representation and inclusivity yeah that's a, it's uh i love this argument and i especially love this argument 
um, or this debate, I guess, in this era, in the COVID era, where all we can do is online, right? Yeah. Um, when I was writing the book, uh, so I wrote like my first draft of the book was it was due like in September of last year, and then the second draft, which was a really significant rewrite. I finished while the pandemic was starting. And so all of the stuff where I was really trying to argue that we need each other and that we cannot replace organizing with digital tools was like, I'm reading this in the lockdown. And I'm like, okay, like, yeah, obviously people are totally going to get this now. Right. But, but you're right. There still is a, a bit of a debate about, um, you know, can we still do it in these uh, stochastic ways? Right. And in, 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 you know, decentralized is, is a difficult world, but word because I, I do think that decentralized feminism is very useful and important, right? Like community-based, not necessarily um, uniting across, uh, like people don't have to do the, the, the broad scale national or provincial level work. But I don't think, like we live in a federation and the only way that we can fight the federation is through federated structures. Like there's no other way because every government will always pass the buck to another government. And if we are not having like there, like literally with like a flamethrower in the face of like Doug Ford and a flamethrower in the face of Jason Kenney and a flamethrower in the, in the face of uh, Jim Watson and a flamethrower in the face of Justin Trudeau, then they're always going to just continue to pass the buck. And so I guess the question becomes, what kind of change do are we working towards? Because decentralized stochastic okay. feminism can, can make some change. It's a way to make some kinds of change. Um, and certainly there are really innovative ways to use the internet. I mean, I like major shout out to the disability filibuster, which was this wonder, and it's still continuing, this, this wonderful five day, 24 hour day event online where disability activists in the lead up to passing Bill C-7 had this non-stop programming in their protest. Only possible to do that online. It was wonderful. And thanks to time zones and people around the world that 24 hours was able to be filled. But, um, but it does not replace real life organizing. It, it just does not. And um, I, you know, we need each other so much. We need we need to be, you know, I kind of think about, this is where I get like back into my religious background, right? Be like, well, I have to go to church, church sucks. And my, my father would always be like, yeah, okay, so church sucks for you, you're a kid, obviously. Like the people who you don't know need your presence that day, need to feel like they're part of a community. They need you there because they don't, like you are their community. That is, you're coming together, you're doing the same thing together and that's how you build community. And that's, I think that's the power of, of religious spaces, that's the power of cultural spaces where you are united just by nature of sharing the same, whatever, belief, characteristic, place of origin, language. You know, you need those spaces, right? Mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm an Anglophone in Quebec City. I've got a lot of Anglophone friends. If those were my only friends though, I would probably like punch myself in the head all the time because their politics mostly suck. But well, that's not true actually because I've got really sweet Anglophone friends, right? So there are spaces, there's a need to have a space where we uh, can come together and not just organize all the time, but to make friendships and, uh -huh. to, um, and to share with one another uh, our, our, like our own experiences. And those experiences might not be obviously related to the, to the business at hand. And so that's where you get social activities. That's where you get hanging out. That's where you get the couch in the women's center. Uh, that's where you get um, you know, just that space where you know where it's like, you know what, so and so might be there. I'm going to drop in and see them or not. Uh, and we can get that. And I think that, you know, if, for folks who've only grown up with the internet, um, that kind of like, I, I suspect we're going to see like young people discovering like serendipity and running into people and knocking on doors. I see this all the time with like the older kids in the neighborhood. There is still a lot of analog relationships that we have, even with. Uh, and social media is just going to get worse. I mean, it's just going to get worse and worse. The place is going to get more uh, terrible and, and uh, more surveyed. And politically, we have to find ways to work around the, you know, these kinds of structures. These are, these are atomizing structures. These are disempowering structures. They can be manipulated. You don't know who's a cop, right? It's, it's easier to figure out who's a cop in your meeting, who's got like the shirt that's, uh, you know, folded still because you just took it out of the package, right? So it really depends on what your goals are, but I'm, I've never heard an argument that advances that absolute decentralization, not working across regions, not, not working nationally, that contends with the Federation. And, and I think that as, like, as a white settler in Canada, 
Uh, my literal only goal needs to be to destroy the Federation. That is my problem, right? Like those are my people, that is my problem. And I don't see how, um, how, we, how we take down the Canadian Federation without also taking down the provinces, without also taking down our cities. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And those are, you know, those are big projects, but they're projects for specific reasons. important to people to acknowledge and, and talk about that responsibility. Um, you mentioned this a little bit at the beginning of your answer, but when you're thinking about looking back at what you've written in a COVID context, does your advice change? Do, or are there like, when you're reading back in some of those passages or in some of those chapters, are you like, oh, I wish I had added this piece or I wish I had also talked about this? Yeah, okay, so one secret is you never rewrite, like don't read your book again. <laughs> okay. That's a good question. No, actually, it's funny because I'm going to be starting, um, I'm, I'm going to be releasing a podcast that's just on this book. And so every episode is going to look at the, cha at the chapters. And so I might be in a better place to answer that question then. Okay. But, um, but I did, you know, I, um, I think my last draft was in like late June. Like, so the last time I read the book through a couple more times was in late June. And so I had enough time to be able to add the elements of the, of the pandemic. I certainly was worried when the pandemic started that everything I was going to say was going to be like completely useless. But the reality is, is that um, everything progressives has said for the last 30 years has been made even more urgent, even more true, even more compelling by this pandemic. And I, I can't like, I mean, all of the job losses of the she session, uh, all of the rhetoric and bluster and frankly bullshit around uh, a national childcare program. It's like, it's not gonna happen under the liberals. The liberals are incapable of not being skinny fucks. It's going to suck. So how do we resist that, right? Um, all of that has become even more urgent uh, in the pandemic. And so um, this is where like, you gotta really like thank the, the, the standbys in theory and whose theory was based on a hundred years before them. And so we've got 200 years of really wonderful ideas that have always been percolating. Where you, where you you know you can like there's some standbys within society right collectivism working together building coalitions building um, building confrontations to power and it will withstand anything it will absolutely withstand this pandemic and um, and it will become even more urgent as we know that the pandemic is also being used as a as a as a chance to not reformulate the Canadian state but absolutely entrench it far more uh, uh, solidly to be able to, to not have a status quo change. Well, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to, I'm, I have a few more questions, but I also wanted to assure the audience that I'm not gonna monopolize Nora's time. So if you have questions, if there are things that you wanted to ask her about the book or some of the um, themes that it brings up, uh, I know that Greg, our lovely organizer from Octopus Books has been putting some prompts in the chat, but please do put your questions there. We would love to hear from you. I'm gonna ask a few more questions and then I promise I'm gonna turn to you and give you an opportunity to ask some of those as well. So Nora, in your book, and you've talked about it as well in some of our conversations, you, taught, you spent a lot of time sort of dissecting the dangers and pitfalls of white feminism. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can perhaps speak a little bit more about how you situate yourself. You self-identified already in this conversation as a white settler in that conversation. So what does it mean for you as a white author to be talking about, you know, a feminism that is decentering whiteness, that is uh, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, and anti-colonial? And in that reflection, what are some of the key takeaways that you have uh, for some other folks in our audience that might identify in a similar way to you? Yeah, so my first draft, um, you know, I really worked really hard to not, I'm like, decenter whiteness, decenter whiteness. And, um, and there were two anonymous peer reviewers that both were like, this is a lot of white feminist bullshit in the first draft of the book. And uh, they are right. Um, so yeah, it's like, um, it, you know, first of all, it's like, you know, you got to name the problem you have, you have to understand that problem, you have to understand how um, the way that you see the world is like, you cannot shed that whiteness, it is always, always present, I will always see the world through the lens of, of being white, that's, that's how white supremacy works. Um, but it's also very important to understand that white supremacy, and this was something that took me a long time to, um, to, to get, like, I, I, you know, when I was in the student movement, I would hear talking about white supremacy 
and how Canada is a white nation and uh, systemic racism exists. And, and these are all the ways that it exists. And I didn't ever disagree with it. I never ever said someone was, was wrong or lying or whatever, which a lot of white people do. So I mean, step one, don't do that. But I didn't understand, like in a lot of the conversations, and you know, we're talking about 2004, 2005, a lot of the conversations I was like, I just don't get this. I don't understand what it means to be in a classroom and feel uncomfortable. Like how can what the professor is saying make you feel uncomfortable? You're talking about nursing, like what the fuck, right? Right, so you, you, you show up and you listen and you listen and you listen. And you're like, oh, that's what, oh, I see, oh, oh. And so through a lot of, um, of listening, even though I talk so much, like, like absolutely believing. And if I don't understand to like try and understand more rather than disbelieving, that was really, really important. That was a process. I mean, I've been, I've been really working on that, listening to the voices of activists uh, who are, are sounding the alarm bells on things like police brutality or sounding the alarm bells on um, racism within the healthcare system, right? So <laughs> my kids are screaming right now behind me. So I was like, Ooh. Um, so how do you do that in this book? It's really, um, it was really interesting. So I, one of the things I started with was, um, I looked at how, uh, Canadian history, which we all know is whitewashed. We all know erases the, the voice of, of racialized women. And how is it, was that fed to me? Right. So I really deconstructed this. So I, I went back to the heritage minutes and, and that's why I started in the chat, in the history chapter, the heritage minutes, these things that ran on TV that told us about Canadian history. Um, and I was watching them through, like specifically looking for how whiteness was upheld in these, in these minutes. And it was amazing. Like every single one of the women dedicated heritage minutes was absolutely like upholding white supremacy. You know, Laura Secord erasing the role of Mohawk of warriors in the fight against the Americans. Um, Jenny Trout, a disabled woman, uh, fights to become a, a med, med student U of T. Look her up for real. Oh, actually she, um, never could finish in Canada because Canada was so brutal to her, right? There's just all these things you're like, wow. And so I really tried to um, follow the voices of, of, of non-white people, um, try to get definitions from, from non-white activists. Um, and so you'll, you'll read some of that in there. Like I mentioned like the, the, the definition of, of feminism, I thought it was really important to give people like how I understand feminism and, and the best definition that I came up with, I came up with that I came across with was, is Harsha Walia's definition. So you can read it, it's quite long. It's really, really wonderful that she gave in an interview. Um, and I tracked who I quoted. I tracked how many times I was quoting white people, how many times I was quoting uh, racialized women and really looking at that to make sure that the source list was not only coming from white women or white people. I mean, there are some white men as well. Um, and so that was really important. It kept me conscious. It kept me, kept me making sure that if a point was made by a white writer, uh, try to see if the, the, a similar point can be made by a black writer and see if the point's more profound, which of course it is, right? That's fucking how it is. Um, and so I, I did a lot of that. Um, and then, so how do you like, you know, when you're, when you're in a society that's white supremacist and you're white, um, you can get all like weird about it, or you could just be like, okay, so I have a, a certain level of understanding how white minds work. I understand how government thinks. I understand how respectability politics works. And I have a responsibility to translate that to people that don't understand how it works. It doesn't make any sense. I have a responsibility to put myself uh, into harm's way and to not put myself into the center uh, unless, unless it's being called for, unless people are saying, no, 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 do this. You should, you should take this, you should take this on. Uh, and that's, um, that's a process that I'm always ne ne negotiating. And, you know, I have a whole bunch of people that I know will like really call me out if I step out of line. And that's a really important um, friendships that I've built with people and, um, and relationships that, um, that help to center me in a space that isn't just about whiteness. That's a space that can be full of lots of different ideas and different perspectives. Um, and then there's a shorthand to all of this, which is if like, where are indigenous women in all of this? If like, are they at the center of what you're doing? And if they're not at the center of what you're doing, you're fucking it up. So how do you back up and figure it out, right? And, and, and that, I, I say it's a shorthand because it's just kind of a cheat, right? It's like, you know, are you talking about violence against women? Okay, which women, who, what kind of violence? Where are they? Are they rural women? Are they poor women? You know, are they disabled women? And, um, and always making sure you're calling back that rather than projecting like what I've experienced as this, you know, oh yes, I've been, you know, I've been sexually assaulted. Yes, I've been sexually harassed. And it's like, it isn't about me, right? It's, it's about, and it is about any individual, certainly not about a white, person. Uh, it's about the collectivity that we build together 
and, 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 and using that collectivity to look at what are the biggest issues. And I'll just end here, you know, one of the, one of the things I was just so scandalized by was when the stories came out of, of women being sterilized within some hospitals on the prairies, uh, indigenous women being sterilized in some hospitals on the prairies. Uh, I knew about that. I have a friend who that happened to. And so it, none of that was surprising to me, but I was happy to see that it was finally being reported and, uh, and people were paying attention to this. And the, and the friend that happened to like, she's my age. I mean, it was like, when she told me that I was, I was just like, you know, not, not shocked, but horrified for sure. So it's obviously stayed with me. And um, the women's movement was nowhere. Like that did not become the issue that the women's movement got behind. There's not much of a women's movement. So it's not like, I'm not blaming anybody because people are all busy and all this stuff, but but people didn't coalesce around that the way they coalesce around childcare. And, yeah. uh, and you know, sterilizing indigenous women seems like a much bigger problem than not having childcare because there is some kind of childcare. There are some spaces, there are some subsidies, there are some ways to get by. People are kind of getting by, but the fundamental uh, violence waged on someone in the hospital in an extremely vulnerable situation having just given birth and then having sterilization forced on them by a doctor i mean it doesn't get more fundamental than that and that is a that's an example that i hold really in my mind all the time uh, when i think of women's movement looking for what's our next issue and you know i think that the white women's movement mainstream um you know bourgeois feminism whatever you want to call it I think that they avoid those issues because then you get back to this question of anti-capitalism and you get that fastest question of anti-colonialism and that's very sticky. And then there's funding and then we're on these committees and we want to have a good relationship with the Mary Monsef and all this stuff. And then that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you did a really great job sort of like highlighting in particular how this government's identification of itself as feminist has really impacted the way movements have been able to interact with them and has dictated, you know, like some of those relationships, especially when we're talking about a movement that is severely underfunded in some cases right so it like it it brings up a lot of, of issues for folks something that you said that really stood out to me is um the importance of being able to surround yourself with you know people that a community of folks that are able to hold you accountable and do that from a place of love but being able to do that in a way that actually encourages your growth i think that you know that thing that it is it, lost often and when we're thinking about how do we actually build movements that are caring that are compassionate but that are also spaces of growing and learning and when I think about you know many of us who have taken non-traditional paths in activism or, or in our understanding and, and shaping around feminism that hasn't always been accessible to us um, but I think specifically thinking about that in this context it goes back to what you were saying before about how like organizing social movements doesn't just mean like rah rah and we hit the streets and then we never talk to each other again it's about coming together talking about our experiences sharing what we're learning sharing how we're growing and you know maybe having that over a meal or something like that so it's really important um and i'm wondering just sort of on this uh discussion around some of the exclusions of white uh, feminism if we can also talk a little bit more about like what what it is meant for us especially to sort of witness this very, um, I, I think it's always been there, but this like sort of firm and trend of trans exclusive feminism and sex worker exclusive feminism, like those are also, and those aren't, you know, unrelated to the whiteness or, or sort of the, the, the neoliberalism that is driving sort of the white feminist movement that you're talking about. But I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about that. As well. Yeah, um, so, uh, <laughs> One, one of the really interesting things about how the feminist movement was organized in the 1970s was that it was um, very politically diverse. So you like literally had church groups and radical feminists like in the same umbrella organization with, with NAC, with the National Action Committee, which is, which is kind of funny, right? And is not kind of like how you would imagine organizing things today. But um, yeah, like, so um, you're right that they're definitely related. Um, I'll talk, I think about both separately. So, um, you know, trans exclusionary radical feminists, uh, turf, I like to call them turf fascists. I think it's, I think it's a, a form of gender fascism really that essentializes gender into like these really rigid poles that like not even biology like <laughs> determines into people, right? So it's like, okay, so you're just gonna make up fantasy science for what reason exactly? Um, it has a history, right? It does come out of, um, of a tension that existed between uh, some like, I write about this in the book that like uh, and I quote um, Juliet Jock, who's a, a writer from the UK, and she was talking about how, 
you know, as, as women were like trying to like be liberated and they're learning or not learning, but like expressing uh, queerness in different ways. At the same time, you also had trans people trying to get access to medical services and medical services often passed through psych uh, psych psychiatric services or, or psychological services that were like oppressing queer women. So there's this weird tension where trans people had to engage with the health healthcare system in a way that queer women didn't need to necessarily engage in the same way. And so kind of movements like started to splinter just because of realities being different. And, you know, it started early, like, you know, very, like very early in, in, in the feminist movement, excluding trans women was quite like common, right? And, and they're very terrible stories in the 1970s of that happening. Um, you know, the, the AIDS crisis decimated queer organizing in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Uh, and trans organizing and trans people, right? Like the, 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 the AIDS pandemic like stopped in a lot, of, a lot of cases activism because people were just surviving. And so as, as the 1980s falls into the 1990s, you get this like radical, quote unquote radical feminist, which kind of comes out of the, that, that, um, that hard kind of lesbian, often not always, but like kind of like anti-man kind of mentality. And then uh, trans inclusive understandings of, of gender changing, but it, it's all based on like this idea that there's a, an essentializing um, relationship between uh, who you are in society and your gender, right? And, and that's, that was the problem with the feminist movement, right? It was that we as women are all united and our, our unity was literally based on the fact that we are women and you take away the fact that we are women and you can be, you know, you can be anything you want when, you know, in the kind of the grandfather way of talking about this stuff. And all of a sudden there, there's no more frame to understand like feminist um, sexism, right? Because uh -huh. the gender binary actually was necessary to understand femin feminist liberation. Like it's very, very, it's so fascinating, right? And, and I think like this is the 1970s, like it's, it's a different, like things were different back then. Things were very uh, fruitful and, and amazing and the radicalness of it uh, often got crushed by the white middle class, uh, you know, proper kind of women uh, of the high society organizations, right? So where does that leave us today? I mean, we have this like, honest to God, I am just so blown away by the way that especially young people, but not only, uh, people are rejecting the gender binary entirely, that there's this incredible rise in identification that is off of the gender binary that is like, Fuck the gender binary, like that is a, that is a social construct, and here's the way I'm expressing myself, and here's where I'm situating myself in relation to society, and that takes nothing away from the struggle from the feminist struggle. In fact, that needs to be at the core of feminist struggle, because you know, if the gender binary falls, and now I'm not talking about turf fascists, but this is why I think turf fascists are are actually fascists. If the gender binary falls, so much of Western capitalism collapses because it absolutely requires us to be uh, at, like 100% policed in our gender expression in a very specific way. And, and young people, I mean, like the, 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 the number of people that I know that are identifying as non-binary are completely rejecting the, 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 the way society has tried to impose gender upon them really shows, I mean, I think like the most radical generation is like coming and it's amazing and young people are doing amazing work. And of course the, the trailblazers have been always trying to resist the stuff who've been doing this forever. Like they're just amazing, but it's a real threat to the status quo. It's a threat to the status quo in a way that not many other things are. And I've, I've talked about this in relation to Jordan Peterson and why his whole like fight on, on pronouns was so important, but it, it's, it's exciting. But it also is very weird because the, the, the idea that you can take feminism to, de to defend the gender binary is really, really fucked up because, you know, men suffer under patriarchy in very profound ways. And, um, and, and one of the ways to fix that is to, is to actually destroy the gender binary, not to necessarily fight for men's rights, you know? And, yeah. um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. And I just have such huge respect for folks doing that activism and um, yeah. And that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I feel like we could like just on that talk so much more because I, I mean, I have many younger uh, siblings and their friends and I'm just so amazed by the level of conversation happening and the total rejection of the gender binary and the ways in which that
really sort of transformed um, our understanding and conversation around, you know, what feminism means or looks like. So I think I, I really, uh, it's, it's a topic that I think is really interesting and that I would love to delve into. But we did have lovely questions from our audience that I also want to make sure that we get to. Yeah. Uh, so I'll jump right into those. Uh, Clark asked, how do we decolonize digital spaces? How do we succeed against surveillance oppression? Yeah, I, okay, so we can't decolonize, like, like digital spaces are colonized spaces, right? I think that we have to be very um, uh, clear about that. And it's funny because Sandy and I are gonna, we've got like always like these like episode ideas in the in the hopper for the weeks where we don't want to talk about politics and, and surveillance is one of those uh, topics. So I'll, I'll give you a sneak peek on what we're talking about or thinking about. Um, I think that we have to um, organize assuming we're being surveyed. I think that the idea that we can be anonymous and that we can, uh, that we won't be doxxed or anything like that is just impossible. And you know, it's funny, like it wasn't that long ago that the newspaper literally would publish Jimmy McNeil in grade eight at 972 Pine Street, right? That was a totally normal thing to be in the newspaper. And that was a way more violent society when it comes to like, like actually like murder, right? Like in some ways, I mean, we can talk about that. But anyway, um, so we, I think that we have to get over the idea that um, any of this can be done in a way that can't be surveyed. And um, that digital spaces are always gonna have um, people watching. That, that we, uh, you know, that as much as you wanna make a space decolonial, let's say, let's say it's completely closed and, and it's only gonna be indigenous people talking to indigenous people and, 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 and talking about colonial, like, like how to decolonize, how to uh, self-determination, like what kind of strategies or whatever even in that space that there's surveillance and it's a space that's not necessarily safe. There's no safe, there's no safeness in, in, in the digital world. There's obviously tools that people should be in, using and you know, you should make sure that you've got, you know, uh, solid digital um, security practices to make sure you're not hacked and all that kind of stuff, which is really important. But you know, when you're, di when your Facebook messages can be subpoenaed by a court, um, you, the, you like, it doesn't matter who you're talking to. It does not matter who you're talking to. A court can subpoena your private messages. So I think it's more about um, engaging with like complete knowledge that, um, that the spaces are imperfect, that there's huge trade-offs uh, for us to engage in these spaces. Of course, the trade-off is that we get to have friends or we get to see people from a lot like far away or we get to meet people we would never ever get to meet. Um, but that, you know, this is why the revolution will not be organized on Twitter, right? It's because um, like, it is so easy to destabilize something that the second that you even had the most perfect space, like one agent provocateur is in there and your perfectly decolonized space is like fucking upside down all of a sudden, right? So um, I, what I would be very interested in, and there is a bit of this kind of discussion is what do we do? How do we keep e each other safe? You know. Like if this this event was Zoom bombed, right? Let's say, which is totally possible. Um, you know, are we able to stop it fast? Are we able to apologize to people? Are people ready for it? You know, that that kind of thing. We we have to be very honest about the limits of a technology that is one hundred percent out of our hands. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, Alexandra asked, "Do you have any thoughts about government funding of not-for-profit organizations and its possible influence on movement priorities and tactics?" Yeah, I'm really critical of government funding, um, and it's funny because um, the National Action Committee was funded by government for so long, and it worked actually. Uh, and actually, the early feminist movement was fueled by government funding because the Trudeau government of Pierre Trudeau. Uh, they gave out these grants for young people. And one of the examples that I saw of one of these grants was that um, like someone was like, I'm going to carve ducks. And the government was like, perfect. Here's your grant. Like you could literally get a grant for anything you wanted. And a lot of things were started that way. Um, you know, Judy Rebick tells me about how people would work the minimum number of hours. They'd go on EI and they would, they would live off of EI to do, to do activism. Um, so that kind of government funding we need that actually, right? That's where you look at the CERB and you're like, yes, I don't think we, it should be universal, but I do think there should be a guaranteed uh, income for uh, uh, some groups of people that we could talk about if we wanted to talk about. I, the reason I don't think it should be universal is a whole other discussion. I have a podcast on it, you should listen to it. <laughs> but, um, the, uh, but government funding of not-for-profits is a huge problem because um, whether or not you feel like you can criticize the government, uh, it's always hanging over your head, right? And it always becomes the argument. And so, you know, there's some not-for-profits that get government funding and they do radical stuff and they're prepared to lose that funding. But by and large, that's not the case because usually that means that someone's got a job, 
that kid, that person might have kids. You don't want to fire them. Right. And then all of a sudden you got 10 people that have the job and 10 people that have kids or 10 people that are just too poor to lose their job. Like, you know, being super average and it becomes a huge problem. Right. So I think that not-for-profits play a role. There's no question. Not-for-profits are filling a huge, huge, huge gap in uh, anything from service, uh, uh, shelter services to gender violence services. Like, I mean, there's so many not-for-profits that, that, that we need, but I, I am very, 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 not suspicious, but um, it's, it's not like, it is a way to control. Unfortunately, it's a way to control. And if the feminist movement was bigger and the not-for-profit world of feminism was like 10%, then, then that would be fine. But the reality is it's like, it's really the feminist movement. It's really that it's the, the not-for-profit and the charities that are doing a lot of the feminist organizing that comprises the feminist movement today. And, uh, and that's also the benefit of having some sort of umbrella organization that allows organizations that are in a precarious position with their finances to take radical action, but under the banner of something else. So that governments have a much harder time uh, attacking them. And that's where labor comes in. Labor has money. Um, like, I mean, relative to nothing, right? They have infinitely more money than nothing. Uh, and, um, and that's where we need to start getting creative about how we're funding uh, our, our, our activism, because it's, it's a bit of a dead end for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm gonna try to put two more questions to you that hopefully we can get through before we wrap up. Yes. So I'm gonna ask you a little bit more brief as well. Um, but these are also really big questions. So okay. it's gonna be a challenge for you. So okay. um, can anyone be, Hillary is asking, can anyone be on the inside of the patriarchal slash colonial institution? Um, is the change from inside kind of idea, how, how does that work? Or can do they have to be taken down from the outside? I am not sure if anyone else got that cut off, but I did not hear that question. It, you unfortunately cut off as you started asking it. Okay. Do you want to let's just read that? Yes. So Hillary is asking, can anyone be on the inside of the patriarchal slash colonial institution and also be a feminist? Change from the inside kind of idea or must they be taken down from the outside? Yeah. I, okay. So anybody that's tried to change something from the inside knows that it's not possible. Um, I don't want people to feel like they're a sellout if they're on the inside or that you're not a real feminist if you're on the inside. But I think we have to look at this not in the individual way, but in the, in the systems way. Are individual feminists within the government going to change the government? Impossible. No. Um, are individual feminists within the government going to be able to respond to public pressure when it's placed on the government? Yes. And so what people need to understand is where do they fit themselves best? Are you the kind of person that can put on a suit, play the game, it's not gonna make you like destroy your soul, then totally go for it. That, that, a lot of people are suited for that. Um, if you're not suited for that, there's nothing wrong with that either. But I do think that we have to be very honest about the limits of trying to change anything from the inside because it's really, 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 really hard uh, unless um, you build a kind of network inside to give yourself the support that's necessary and you have connections to the outside to be able to say, hey, heads up, this is coming. Heads up, this is coming. Heads up, get 10,000 people in the street in two weeks and we'll be able to give more money. Because there is also a game, a political game that, 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 that does need to be played. And that does require feminists on the inside. You know, I don't doubt that Marianne Monsef thinks she's a feminist. I think that it doesn't matter is the reality. It's the actions that matter and it's the way that the feminist movement can push someone like her into the right, into the right direction. Um, so for our last question, I'm actually going to make them questions. They're a bit related. Uh, they will sort of uh, think back to the pandemic. So Monica is asking, what opportunities have we slash progressives missed over the pandemic? How could these lessons prepare us for the years ahead? And Scott is actually wondering, your, in your examination of the pandemic of COVID-19, um, and all the ways in which that has exposed the systemic edges of our society, how have you changed your communication tactics? So, you know, what are the moments that you've noticed that, that we've missed? What yeah. are the lessons ahead? And, you know, how has that impacted the way that you organize? Yeah, I think that feminists have definitely missed a couple of moments. Um, talking about the massive job losses, 
Uh, there has not been a popular uprising to talk about the she session. In fact, the she session is only being talked about like by five people within Canadian society. Even if it's something that's like shared by lots of people, it's the airspace has all been taken up by only a few people, which says that there's not a movement behind it, which is just too bad. And then we have, we also have missed an opportunity with the childcare stuff. Like, um, as I said, the liberals are just like, they're literally incapable of not being shitty. And so how, like the, whatever they develop on the childcare front, needs bodies in the street, needs public pressure, needs office occupations, it needs people putting together the plan and putting it forward. Because if that pressure isn't there, they will screw this up. And so, you know, while we've missed it, I mean, I think it's also important to recognize that the, the organizing in the pandemic has been weird, that, um, that, the, that the, the gold standard of organizing the pandemic, I would say, has been Black Lives Matter and the, the disability activism around uh, C7 neither were successful yet, right? Bill C-7 was a failure. And I know a lot of people involved with that are like, oh my God, we tried so hard, we failed. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter, there's a lot of demands and there's a lot of action and people were in the streets and they were so amazing. And still like, it's really hard to convince government. I think we have to be very honest that we're in a moment where governments are fully ignoring what people want. And that requires um, an incredible mobilization that has not happened in this, in this country for, for a generation, if not more. Um, and so have we missed it? Yes, but it's not the end of the world because we're still in the pandemic and we still have lots of time. And, um, and even if nothing happens in the pandemic, we have to um, pull off of all of the strings that we can see that are radicalizing people. This is an incredible radicalization moment. I'm sure you've seen this in your own life. I'm blown away by the politics that I'm seeing develop and the people around me every day. And so we need to be thinking, okay, where are we able to intervene personally in the groups that we have to take advantage of this moment? And if the moment passes, I mean, then we organize the next moment. I mean, Christ, it's like we got infinite moments until the, the earth explodes, right? Or until we die. So, you know, you know, we might as well keep, keep trying. How have I changed? Um, okay, there's two things that I'll mention. One, um, and, and this isn't me actually, but this is kind of like the organizing that I do in Quebec City. So um, I've been really involved in the last number of years, like since the shooting at the mosque in, in, uh, in St. Foy in, in uh, commemorating the, what happened. And it's been very fascinating because the people involved are not like political, right? We're, we're united in like rejecting Islamophobia and hatred and in like united against a really horrible act, right? So like the bar is super low for what would get someone involved, right? You don't have to have a massive political analysis to understand that what happened was terrible. We need to memorialize it. And the politics have shifted in this group of people. It's very interesting because we got people with very, 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 very different politics. And um, uh, out of this group of people, a couple of us were like, okay, we also need a revolutionary organization. <laughs> so we're gonna be, we're starting also more revolutionary organizing where um, we're talking about more theory and we're talking about more, more how to unite and bring together different uh, groups doing really great work, but try to give like a framework to that. And, um, and the pandemic has been a moment of like reflection in this and the need to do this. So you continue to do that work, you continue to do like the service kind of oriented, helping people make sure that, um, that this act is never forgotten and that we're always memorializing it. But you're also taking the relationships that you formed, that we formed in this group, and then trying to build it out into something that can be more radical. And on a personal level, um, I have fuck, I've just been like, fuck everything. I mean, I'm like, like, I'm just fucking like now, blah. I, I, any, any tether that I had between me and fucking uh, things being possible with government, like gone, right? I was talking to Sandy. I was like, I think that this pandemic has literally made me from a socialist into an, a full on anarchist. Like I am like, not convinced about anything being possible anymore within any big structures, which is kind of funny. Maybe that would be something I'd read in the book. No, I'm kidding. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm half kidding too, but it means that I'm, I'm now talking in revolutionary terms. I'm not worried at all about talking revolutionary terms. I'm really excited to argue with people who disagree with me and we're like, ah, let's have it out. It'll be no problem. I'm going to totally convince you and, um, and be relentless and relentlessly explaining what all of this, all of these pieces uh, are understanding that most people are not as um, uh, like most people watch TV or they watch movies, right? I don't do any of that stuff. So I'm online all the time. And I, if, if I can then draw a line from A to B and that'll help people out, then I'm really, really like committed to try and drawing those connections to, to do that education piece as much as I can. So that's kind of how I've changed a little bit of my, um, of my involvement, my, my communication strategy, I guess. Um, but uh, but it's really hard because I, I also want to just say that, um, you know, 
people's mental health is very clearly um, not great, right? And, and I'm sure you all probably have experiences. Uh, I, I more and more am in one-on-one -on -one situations with people in crisis. And it's like, and it, like family, friends, neighbors, this kind of thing. And it's like, that is also really hard because it's like, like, wow. Like, how do you, how do you manage this? How do you navigate this? How do you make sure that you're there for people uh, recognizing that the system is completely failing? And, um, and that really makes it hard to then also do kind of the general advocacy work because it was like, also like, I mean, in this conversation, I've gotten, I think 50 messages from somebody. Right. So you know, it's, it's really, really difficult. And I think that all of us who um, might find ourselves in a situation where people are asking us for help or advice or support or whatever, uh, we have to take care of ourselves as well and, um, and make sure that we get out of this pandemic with uh, the kind of energy that, um, that the new world is going to require of us. Yeah, very important pandemic lessons right there. Um, so, I mean, I would love to be here all night with you, but we do have to wrap this up. Could you tell us quickly, like 30, 60, seconds why should people get this book oh just i mean just do it like i don't you don't you don't even need to know why just do um it, i i think uh, like if you like this talk it's all in the book um it, it'd be great to support me too because that's the secret is like authors are paid nothing so uh i will get uh you know six bucks out of the, no probably less than that if you buy the books that'd be sweet um yeah, uh, or get in the library, right? I really, I know it's on hold in Ottawa. It's been on hold in Ottawa since it came out. Um, it's been on hold in Toronto since it came out. Uh, it, it's been on hold in Calgary since it came out. So get it into your public library as well and make sure that people um, have access to read it. And then and then if you disagree with me, like come in, let's argue, let's have a debate. That'd be great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nora. It's been really lovely to be able to reconnect with you and chat with you about this. Um, I am incredibly excited and really fortunate to have gotten a copy from Octopus Books. I know Octopus Books has also been posting some links about where you can get a copy uh, to Nora's book. And so please do check that out uh, if you're in the audience right now. And uh, for folks that joined us from all over, thank you so much for being there. Thanks for asking your questions. I know we didn't get to everyone's questions, but you know, just scrolling through some of them right now, they were so thoughtful and genuine and interesting. So I know that we had a really engaged um, an awesome audience and it was really great to be able to spend this time with all of you folks so thank you very very much and i hope that you folks get to enjoy the rest of your evenings or afternoons no matter where you are joining us today thank you